Hi, so by now you've probably heard of the pilot YouTuber called Trevor Jacob, who is facing some serious long jail time for an incident where he jumped out of his plane and let it sail down and crash unmanned. I don't know anything more about this incident than anybody else reading the news. It seems to me that the charges he's facing at the moment is for handling the wreckage afterwards more than anything else. And the latest is that he's pleaded guilty to that federal charge of destruction and concealment within the intent to obstruct a federal investigation, which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in federal prison. People have made their own opinions about whether the jump was legitimate or if he did it for a stunt for YouTube views. I won't comment on that, but what I will do is I can tell you as a UK private pilot what the usual procedure is for engine failure according to the training that we get here in the UK. And from what I've seen, it's basically the same anywhere else. So this won't be a thorough description of everything a pilot has to do in this situation because every situation is different. But for those that want to know what a typical engine failure in a light aircraft involves so that you can compare it to what you saw in Trevor's video then this video is for you and then you can make your own mind up to think whether this was intentional or not. Okay so let's start with prevention when you're on the ground. You'll probably notice us pilots having to walk around the aircraft before we do anything. This is our chance to see if all looks well with the aircraft before we even think about starting it up. One of the main things we check for is fuel. Do we have enough fuel for the journey with reserves in case of needing to divert or having multiple attempts at landing. We also check the fuel quality and th that the fuel pumps work and that the fuel taps are on. Once we're in the air, we monitor the engine temperatures and pressures and fuel constantly, especially in the climb. But even during the cruise, we do something known as Frida checks, which is checking the fuel, radio frequency, engine temperatures and pressures, direction and altitude. Now, talking about altitude, the higher the better in case of engine failure. The more altitude we have, the more distance we can travel in the glide and the more time we have to plan things before reaching the ground. So if we have to fly over built up areas, for example, we make sure that we are at, are at an altitude where we can land clear of people and property should the engine fail. It is good practice to always know which direction the wind is coming from because we'll be looking at the ground for good fields and places to land should the engine quit and we always want to land into wind. In the video that Trevor put out, he does seem to have plenty of altitude and time to make a plan. After all, he did have time to jump out and deploy a parachute and land safely. Okay, so what happens when the engine stops or what should happen? The very first thing that you do is to get the aircraft flying, meaning lower the nose to maintain best glide speed. This will give you the most options in terms of distance traveled and time in the air. Then you need to assess your situation. If you're high enough, do you have time to work out what the problem is to try and get that engine restarted? If you do, then you'll be looking at the fuel quantity. Do you have any? Have you ran out on one of the fuel tanks? Are the fuel tank taps on? Is the fuel pump on? Are both magnetos on? What are the engine temperatures and pressures showing? Are there any temperatures that are high? Any pressures that are low? Is there something that is fixable basically? Like selecting a different fuel tank or maybe you missed one of the magnetos. If you've got the time, try for a restart. Okay, so what if you can't restart the engine or you're too low and you don't have the time to have a look at what's going wrong and you immediately need to plan for an emergency landing? Well, you'll be looking for a place to land, of course. You wouldn't just be thinking about jumping out. Rarely do pilots fly with parachutes. It's probably safer for the people on board and the people on the ground for the pilot to an attempt a landing rather than bail out the aircraft. Although some newer aircraft do have ballistic parachutes that can be deployed, if you have structural failure, such as losing a wing or the tail, then a ballistic parachute is probably your only way out alive. But structural failure is rare and most likely from a mid-air collision or a bird strike, or maybe from aerobatics when you've stressed the aircraft frame past its structural g-force limitations. So, considering a place to land, you want to take into account the wind direction. We always land into wind. We'll be looking for a nearby airfield preferably, but if there isn't one around or we can't reach one, then we'll be looking for a field or some kind of smooth surface to land in that we can reach considering our glide performance. Fields are good if there are any. Trevor didn't have many options here. 
Trent Palmer talks about the options that he did have in his video breakdown, which I recommend you watch for his input on the situation. Quite interesting. Once you've found a landing area and you want to consider landing in it, you need to assess that landing area for size, shape, surroundings, slope, and surface. We want somewhere big enough to land in, of course, one that's primarily flat rather than undulating, away from buildings, power lines, turbines, etc. And for the surface, obviously, we want like a grass field if we can find one, or at least something that doesn't have lots of crops in it or deep ploughed grooves. For Trevor, it would have been about avoiding that dense bush, which he ended up finally actually landing in with his parachute. It probably goes without saying that if you have a passenger on board, you want to explain to them what's going on. Make sure they're not panicking too much. Let them know that you've trained for this and that you actually have a plan. You also want to turn off the main fuel line in case of crash landing and to avoid a fire. You want to make sure that your harnesses are tight in case of crash landing as well. You also want to put out a mayday call. So if you aren't in radio contact with anyone, then there's always distress and divert, which is always the frequency 121.5 worldwide. So you can tune to this frequency and you know how the rest goes. You've seen it a million times in films. You say mayday, mayday, mayday. mayday, mayday, mayday. mayday. Tell them the nature way. of the problem, where you are, what you plan to do, how many people are on board, things like that. There is actually a specific format for this, but when the panic's on, just get your message out there. Let somebody know that you're going down and that you're going to need some help. If time permits, you'll turn your transponder to 7700, which sends out a squawk of distress along with your location, which is very handy for search and rescue. Finally, after all this, you're probably close to the ground now. The rest is down to your piloting skills to get to the chosen landing area and to put it down accurately and slowly. You're better off landing than crashing, but if you're going to crash, you're better off crashing slowly. Just watch the stall speeds as you turn and open the doors just before landing for a quick getaway should you need to. Once down, you'll want to ensure that the fuel lines are off, the throttle is fully open and get away from the aircraft in case of fire. You don't go back to the wreckage to collect your cameras and tamper with it. So I hope Trevor's video hasn't put you off flying in light aircraft. Please realize that pilots do train for these situations and aircraft are very well maintained and modern piston engines are more reliable than ever. Here are some stats on aircraft safety to reassure you. From 2004 to 2018, the US recorded an average of only 4.7 fatal accidents per 1 million flight hours in small aircraft. So that's incredibly small. Between 2014 and 2018, the US actually saw a 4% decrease in fatalities from small plane crashes. So that implies they're getting safer as well. The fatality rate for precautionary landings is just 0.06%. A precautionary landing is a landing that a pilot makes when there is a problem and they need to land immediately. This type of landing usually means that the pilot has some power to work with and can circle the landing area prior to touchdown to ensure that it is actually a safe enough place to land. For forced landings, which is when you have no power, it's roughly 10% fatality rate, implying that the survivability rate is 90%. Ditching in water has the worst fatality rate at 20% fatality rate. I'll put the links in the description below for the sources of these statistics and for all the footage I've used in this video, you might want to check out some of those amazing landing attempts under very stressful conditions. Well done to all the pilots that managed to get through those safely. So I hope you found this information informative. If you did, like and subscribe and consider the super thanks which is down there and leave me a tip. It all helps to keep the lights on. If you're a pilot learning to fly, please don't take this information here that I give you as gospel. I'm a private pilot, but I'm not a flight instructor. Always get your information from official sources. If you aren't a regular flyer of light aircraft, then I hope this video has made you feel more confident in light aircraft. Thanks for watching. If you want to get into flying, please see my video series here. And I'm Pilot Mike.